want you to be considering as we discuss together God's word this morning and consider what he has to say to us. The question is this. We talk about God being unstoppable, and he is, as long as we let him. Let me say that again with a little expansion. God is unstoppable. But for reasons I can't fully explain, He has chosen to work through us. And He has invited us to be a part of His work. And so the one who has no limit to His power has chosen to accept some limitation because He's put a lot of His work in our hands. Which means we have the ability to at least inhibit or limit how he does what he does. God can bring about anything he wants to do, but he's chosen to work through us. Don't miss the weight of that this morning. Don't miss the opportunity in that this morning. Don't miss the responsibility of that this morning. <clears throat> But the question I have for you, related to that, since we have such a, an authority and responsibility and power and opportunity, is how well are you eating? Got some grins. I didn't get any like my German shepherds used to do to me. Huh? How well are you eating? Eating has a lot to do with how we're doing, doesn't it? Eating has a lot to do, I'm majoring in the obvious, I know that. Eating has a lot to do with our ability to produce, to enact, to carry out. And I want to talk to you just for a few minutes about eating this morning. You see, eating has become very important to me not just the fact that I eat, but what I eat, when I eat, and how I eat. Not just recently, some time ago actually. It's actually been growing for quite a while in my adult life. Because as I began to look to aging, and then began to actually age, I became more and more mindful, as a lot of people do, of my family history. And there are a lot of things in my family history that would say, hey, you better pay attention to what you're eating and how you're living. So I began to be a label reader. I'm one of those. And I'm one of the ones that, when I used to go shopping, grocery shopping with my wife, she could leave me in the produce aisle and come back some days later. And I might or might not be finished. I like to learn about what we're eating because it matters. And what I put in my body matters a lot and has, I'm learning, a significant influence on how well I'm able to do what I want to do and feel called to do. Now, it doesn't always look like something you might just say, hey, yeah, let's get on that bandwagon. And I'm not looking at her, but I can promise you my wife is smiling right about now because she probably has an idea of some of what I'm going to put on the table for you. You know, I didn't know what exactly to share, so I thought, well, let's start at the beginning of the day, right? Because I'm a breakfast eater. I'm a real proponent of getting up early in the morning, mainly because I just wake up early <coughs> in the morning, and eating well. Have you wondering? Some days it's you know, pretty straightforward, pretty pretty simple, not too far out there. It's, you know, something like cereal. Good Quaker oats. And then just to add to it, I add ground flaxseed. Mm. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> there are some other things that I add to that on morning. Sometimes I eat eggs, but I decided not to bring Something needs to be refrigerated to sit out here all morning with me. And I make smoothies with healthy stuff in them, you can imagine. But that's probably a tamer breakfast of mine. 
Then I get a little radical, and I do this several times a week. I have a whole wheat toast. That's not so radical. But then one of my favorite things for breakfast that I have just been amazed at what it has done in me, and as I continue to learn more about it, and that is... Salmon. <laughs> Better known as cat food. <laughs> Canned salmon. Why salmon? Well, hey, look, I'd love to have fresh grilled salmon. But it doesn't quite fit in my budget. But canned salmon is actually wild caught salmon, which is the healthiest. And you don't have to read far at all. You don't have to read much at all to learn how healthy salmon is for you. Now, it may just literally turn your stomach to think that I eat it right out of the can, but I do. Two, three times a week. Can I just have you not? <laughs> Just say. Hey, right on. That's it. Yep. Mackerel is a good one to add in there. But for me, it's a can of salmon, and whole wheat toast, and often a smoothie, or just some sort, some kind of good, healthy um, beverage to go along with it. Now you may be thinking, what in the world? Where is this headed? I know Church 180 has a history of promoting good health. And from what I have seen as I've watched sermons before I came here, physical fitness was quite important. And I could spend time talking about that this morning, but I thought I would share something that is particularly a passion of mine, and that is eating. Not to say fitness isn't, and I'm beginning to work on that as well, but eating is where I have concentrated my efforts for a very long time. And it's because very affordable, eating well enables me to do what I want to do and what I feel called to do. Now, eating is also very important to people who maybe don't just have the, the ability to pick and choose. Eating, as you know, again, Captain Obvious, uh, eating is important to all of us to survive. But some of us are in a position where eating becomes a lot more important because it's, it's not so guaranteed. As a matter of fact, without help, it might be a real struggle. And that's where we pick up our story in the scripture this morning. We've been working our way through Acts and I invite you to turn to Acts chapter 6 this morning. Where we pick up the story of the movement of God, the spread of the gospel just continuing and growing. And it says in verse 1, but as the believers rapidly multiplied, and you might substitute in belief for the word believers, disciples. That's really what he's talking about here. Luke, when he's writing Acts. He's talking about those who have heard the message and believed. Those who have gotten on board, if you will. Those who are taking very seriously Jesus for who He is and what He's called them to do. And they are multiplying, not just adding. They are multiplying. And yet there were rumblings of discontent. It's just like us, isn't it? Just like us as people. Sadly, just like us even as Christians. You get a good thing going and it doesn't take long for some of us to start grumbling. In this case, it appears to have been justified. And while we don't have all the details, apparently as the multiplication was happening and people from all over were joining Jesus' family, you had not only Jews that were living in, in Judea and Galilee and around Jerusalem, that area, who had been Jewish for a lifetime, or maybe even some that had, had been in the area for a long time but not born Jewish, they had become Jewish. This group of people made up a significant number, but there were others. There were those that were maybe Greek-speaking, those who lived on the outskirts, maybe those who had returned from the diaspora. Well, big churchy word. But when the Jews had been scattered early on, when the temple had been destroyed way back before this time, and people had come back 
to Jerusalem after they had returned from exile. Those people were still Jewish, but, but they were Greek speakers now because that was the language of the larger world. And so they had reconvened into the area. Some came just recently with the trade routes and, and hearing the gospel and coming in. So you had a mixture of people, Greek speaking, if you will, and Hebrew or Aramaic speaking locals. Well, again, you know how we people are. Anytime you put two groups of different kinds of people together, it doesn't really make any difference how different they are or why they're different. We find ways of highlighting our differences instead of our interest in common. And so they began to grumble. Now, in this particular case, they grumbled because some seemed to have been disadvantaged in the food distribution. Now, depending on the translation you're reading, some say food distribution, others say finances or, or resources. But the idea is probably this. When these Christians gathered together, these new first-time converts to, to Jesus, when they gathered together, you remember from our early study in Acts, they had done what? They pooled all of their resources. They became family. And in fact, some of these may have had to give up their former family because they were not welcomed any longer. You've left the faith. And that still happens in our world today in a lot of places. And so we become family together in Jesus. And sometimes that's just for a lot of us, that's just a blending. I still have my biological family. They welcome me. I have a church family. You welcome me. But for others... But for others, they, they come together as a new family. And their needs that they previously had don't just go away. But now their source of, of support is different. Now they're relying on the new family, and that's what was going on here. They were needing to support each other, and somehow, for some reason, part of this group felt shorted or slighted. And they complained about it. They complained, and, and, and then their leaders, their speakers for them, those particularly of the, the Greek-speaking or the Hellenists, they said, hey, to the apostles, our widows, who would have been some of the poorest of poor, you know, the most vulnerable because they had no one standing up and speaking for them, they're getting shorted. What are you going to do about it? Now think about the practical implication. If they don't have enough food, if they're getting shorted, well, they're not going to eat as well, right? Again, Captain Obvious. But think about the implications. What does it say about a new family if you're only taking care of part? So the apostles knew it was important, and yet they also knew hey, this doesn't stop the need for us to keep preaching and teaching the Word. This doesn't stop our primary call for praying. Not just praying, praying. Lots of prayer. Because, of course, they knew it wasn't them. It was God that was growing the church. So you better be talking to Him. You better be crying out to Him. You better be bringing to His attention all the needs so that He can meet them, which is prayer. But they also needed to be teaching and preaching because this was a new word. It wasn't really, you know, it was a lot of the same word, but it was new in their interpretation of it. Their understanding that this Jesus was somehow the fulfillment of the same, but different. So the apostles, not discounting the concerns, simply said, but we have to keep doing what we've been called to do. So choose from among yourselves some important people. People you consider godly, if you will. Good reputation, trustworthy. They also need to be wise. They need to have skill and understanding. They need to be able to manage resources. And most importantly, they need to be full of the Spirit. Because if the Spirit is the one who grows the church, if the Spirit is the one who's leading this new movement, your leaders better be filled <coughs> with the Spirit. So these are the people the apostles said you need to, and pick seven of them, you need to elect these, bring them forward, present them to us. 
and we will assign them, appoint them and assign them the task of taking care of your widows. Take care of balancing this out. Now again this morning I ask you the question, how well are you eating? How well are you eating? I find it really interesting as we've been studying Acts, and maybe you found this too, to kind of to kind of watch the movement and listen to what God is doing in reflection on what had been. Because this is a new movement, but it's not totally divorced from what had been. Somehow God is restarting. Somehow He's doing something new with the old. And so I reach this place in our, our study. And I think, okay, he's assembled a group of people called the apostles that represent the Israelites. The new Israel, if you will. And he's going to lead them in being who they're called to be. And then I think back, okay, what did God tell the first Israel? What was he doing when he was forming and shaping them into people the first time? If he's doing it now in a new way, forming a new group of people, well, what was he telling the first group, and is he doing that again? And this came to my mind. Jesus said it. And maybe a good way to remember it, because I do think there's real benefit in not just reading and studying the Word, but memorizing it. Fascinating that both Matthew and Luke would have the same thing recorded in chapter 4 of their two books. Verse 4. So turn to either one of them. Matthew 4.4 4 or Luke 4.4. 4. And you'll find there Jesus is being tempted. And He answers the evil one. The arch enemy of God. Who has challenged Jesus to just satisfy his hunger when he was craving food. He challenged him. Ah, oh, just turn these stones into bread. Feed yourself, man. It's been a long time since you've eaten. These aren't words of Scripture, but you can imagine the taunting. You can do anything. Turn these stones into bread. And what did Jesus say? Yeah. We don't live by bread alone. Man doesn't live by bread alone. Human beings don't live by bread alone. Now it's interesting that that part is both at Luke 4.4 4 and Matthew 4.4, 4, but there is a difference. Matthew adds the rest of the statement. What does he add on the end of it? Maybe you know this. Maybe you've memorized it. Not just man doesn't. Humans don't live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of the Lord, the mouth of God. Well, that's interesting. It's still about eating. You may know, maybe your Bible tells you if you have one of those, that these are actually quotations from way back when God was forming the first people. you got to go back to Deuteronomy, an incredibly important book an incredibly important record of how God was forming and shaping that first people and He was teaching them how to be His people, how to be different, how to reflect who He is. We've talked a lot about that. He set out the laws for them that we oftentimes look at as a negative thing because in fact some people turn them into a negative thing. But they were given to help the people know how to live. But in order for them to actually help people know how to live as Jesus' people, as God's people, you've got to be able to do them. And then you have to actually do them. And so in Deuteronomy chapter 8, God says this, Be careful to obey all the commands I'm giving you today. Then you will live and multiply, and you'll enter and occupy the land of the Lord, the land, excuse me, the land the Lord swore to give to your ancestors. 
Again, that doesn't necessarily mean anything to us unless you know how much it meant to those people. They had a land of their own. And it was going to be a great land with lots of blessing, but they had to follow God's instructions in order to get there and to live successfully and multiply while they were there. Remember how the Lord your God led you through the wilderness for these 40 years. Catch it? 40 years in the wilderness. Jesus was 40 years, 40 days in the wilderness. Humbling you and testing you to prove your character and to find out whether or not you would obey His commands. How did He humble them? How did He test them? Man, He went right to the root, didn't He? No matter who you are or where you are, you have to eat. And He went right after our stomachs. He tested them. Yes, He humbled them, verse 3 says. He humbled them by letting you go hungry and then feeding you with manna, a food previously unknown to you and your ancestors. What are we going to eat? This stuff? Are you kidding me? This would be like canned salmon for breakfast. I'm not eating this stuff. No way. Yuck. Oh, yeah, God gave it to me. I guess it's supposed to be good for me. I guess maybe it'll sustain me. But the same stuff over and over and over? This is not exactly your top-of-the-shelf exciting sugary cereal for breakfast. He did teach you that people do not live by bread alone. Hmm. Rather, we live by every word that comes from the mouth of the Lord. For all these 40 years, your clothes didn't wear out and your feet didn't blister or swell. Think about it. Just as a parent disciplines a child, the Lord your God disciplines you for your own good. He gave them that unappetizing, unappealing food to teach them discipline, to teach them reliance, to say, hey, look, this may not be your choice. This may not be, wow, get up and go excited. But if you'll trust me, I'll bless you. And you will do well. So I ask you again, friends, people of the church, people of the new Israel, how well are you eating? How well are you eating? It was important in forming God's first people. And now apparently His Son has come and quoted in two of the four Gospels, He said the same thing when speaking to the enemy, the arch enemy. It's not by bread alone, but by the very Word of God. Every Word of God. So I could very well put back in front of you that wonderful appealing can't wait to go get it. It's going to be a run on this afternoon. I'm glad I'm stocked up because I won't be able to find it at the grocery stores after you get out of here. Can of wild caught salmon. <clears throat> but we don't live by bread alone. So what do we live by? What do we live by? Peace is a fun answer. But the real answer? Sometimes we do things that are just, well, they seem silly. Sometimes we just play along with the teacher, right? Sometimes it helps us to actually go through some silly exercises. So I'll ask you to answer the question together. Jesus said in Matthew 4, 4, humans don't live by bread alone, but by 
every word that comes from the mouth of God. It's incredibly important. Captured in two of the four Gospels. Do you get how important it is? Sure, Pastor, we get it. If we people live according to our Lord by every word from the mouth of God, I guess we ought to read it. I guess we ought to know it. Because you can't eat what you don't have. And if you don't eat, you won't make it. Every day, every day, we need to be reading His Word. Every day. Every day. We need to be reading His Word. We need to be eating the food that has come from the mouth of our Father. Oh, that's gross. Think about the birds. The mama and the daddy birds that take the food and they get it just right and then they put it in the mouths of the babies. Sometimes God has to feed us like that. And He says if you want to make it, you got to get my word. You need to take it in every day. So it needs to have front and center place in our life. You can use other things to help you. I get it. I do. And I brought these sincerely for you to take a look at if you're not familiar with devotions. Because some people can't just dive into the Word. Some of us need, if you've not been in the habit of doing this, you need some devotions to help. People, God is gifted and given a passion to write application, to write explanation, to help us get into the Word. This is called This Day with a Master by Dennis Kinlaw, a mentor of mine. It's a little deeper. It has scripture reading. It references scripture reading. But then he has just, I mean, it's not a huge book. It's a page or maybe two, no more than that. Most of them are just one page that help you get into a habit of doing a daily devotion. So that's one of them I'd encourage you to pick up. Because it helps you to get into the Word, to see it more easily. There's another one, if that one doesn't do it for you, a little bit lighter weight. It's called Strength for the Journey. Now, these are not the only two. Good grief. You can look online at any Christian bookseller. Matter of fact, you can get them from places that aren't even Christian. There's devotions all over the place. Strength for the Journey is a really good one as well. There's a reference to Scripture, but it's a little bit easier, a little less deep, and a great way to receive help in applying God's Word and understanding what it's about. Strength for the journey. And again, just like this day with a master, are ways of lifting up Scripture and helping us to see it and get into it a little bit better. If we're going to eat from the mouth of God, we have to get into it. We've got to get it, access it, open it up, and eat it. This does me no good. I mean, I'm telling you, I could spend three weeks of talking to you all day long about how good salmon is and I probably couldn't cover all. I challenge you, go read about salmon. It's unbelievable. You'd be deaf, dumb, stupid, blind, whatever else. You could not know how to read. And I'm not, I'm not, I don't mean to, to knock on any of those people. What I mean to say is you can just be beyond the ability to learn anything and you can figure out salmon's good for you. Everybody's telling you salmon's good for you. 
but not unless you get it out of the can. It does me no good sitting under my pantry in the can. And you say, okay, Pastor, I get it. Good grief, you're beating this one to death this morning. Oh, I hadn't even started. <laughs> I mean, I could play the game with you. I could do the 20 questions. I could ask you the very simple questions that you'd say, oh, really? Are we really going to go through this? Do you call Him your Lord? Yes. Does that mean Lord of some things? No, that means Lord of all things. Does it mean Lord of your life and my life? Yes. Does that mean we ought to listen to Him? Sure it does. What does He tell us? Twice in the Gospels, He said, it's recorded, He says, not by all the good stuff you like to get and eat alone. He doesn't say don't. He says not only, but by the Word of God. So I ask you again, how are you going to get it if you don't get into it? And I'm harping on it this morning because my very first pastor, when I began to pastor as an associate, the very first pastor I had said something that it just, I, I thought, oh, you've got to be kidding. That is so, no, surely not. I asked him one day why he kept teaching on the same thing. And he said because in his 30 plus years of pastoring, he had learned the statistic was true. If you really want to get somebody to, to, to really get something, at least in the role of preaching, you got to give it to them 11 times. I thought, man, I'm not the brightest tool in the toolbox, but 11 times? you got to be kidding. You know what I've discovered? you got to eat a lot of salmon if it's going to really, really get in you and help you. Friends, I'm confident that we're not in the Word as much as we ought to be. That doesn't mean, oh, well, yeah, we could be in it 24-7. No, I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about just daily, regularly meeting and studying and praying. God, help me get your words into me. And the reason I know we're not doing that on a regular basis without taking a poll is because if we were doing it on a regular basis, the results would be so obvious I wouldn't even have to point them out. That's the truth. And if you're feeling your toes stepped on this morning, hey, might have been stomped on. They were stomped on until I finally began to do it. And I can tell you, I'm taking the extra time this morning to tell you, it is vital for your health. It is vital for your growth. It is vital for your well-being. If He's our God, and if He said, this is what we live by, he, he, it wasn't just a nice story. It wasn't just a figure of speech. He meant it. And He still means it. we got to get into His Word, folks. And use whatever tools you need to help you get into it. But we've got to get into it. Because it is the difference between healthy living and a way we don't want to go. So I ask you again this morning, how well are you eating? I hope you're eating well. Not because it's the sermon I preached. Not because I'm your pastor. Well, not just because I'm your pastor. I want you to thrive. Every single one of you. So I lean around to make sure I can see every face. I want you to thrive. I want you personally to do well. I want you to have a rich, fulfilling life that takes what God makes available and just explodes in us 
to bring about blessing. And we have to eat well. 